we're always creating, we're creating unconsciously or consciously. And the quote that I opened the book with is from Carl Jung, and he says, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we will call it fate. So we want to look at how we can bring all everything that's in the unconscious into conscious awareness so that we can start to heal it. And working with people over the years, and certainly in my own journey, I thought it was like set a goal, set an intention, make it happen. But there's something much deeper. Welcome back to the Sobriety Diaries, friends. I'm your host, Nate Kelly, founder of Pod Studio and recovering alcoholic eight and a half years from my last drink, which is crazy to even say out loud. Check today's show notes for more information on the services we offer at Pod Studio and how we could work together. Let's cut to the chase, though. I'm so excited for today's conversation. Two previous conversations you can find in seasons one and three with my now friend, TJ Woodward. TJ, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? I am well, Nate. I am so grateful that we're back doing this. Uh, I had forgotten that we had done two, so I'm going to go back and watch them. But I do remember knowing and just loving our conversations in the other episodes. So I'm happy to be back with you. So exciting. You know, one, I think our second conversation, you and I tapped into uh, my six-year-old self and went and, and, and kind of you know, it was a, a meditative uh, session, really. And uh, it really helped me to heal things. And it's, well, one, one of our top rated episodes and one of the episodes that people reference the most to me and that they really resonate with one of the, the more powerful episodes. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I do remember that process. And really going back and doing some work on healing shame, which I know is what we're talking about today. So that's such a perfect segue. And I know in my own journey, I had to really go back and do some work with reconnecting and healing myself from that younger self, not just through my own awareness and present time awareness and through thought. So I'm super grateful for that. And thank you for the reminder. I'm going to go back and watch it. I'm excited to see it. Yes. Yes, thank you for bringing up shame again. You know, this episode will air this month, so it is Pride Month and I had this idea to, you know, this this thought of pride versus shame. And so many of our queer brothers and sisters, I think experience shame at at an early age and you know, a lot of the stories that I hear have shame sort of woven through uh, addiction and recovery. So I thought it was, you know, I had this idea and I wanted to save it for our conversation. I thought it would be perfect. But do you find yourself sort of thinking back? um, my, My shame to pride sort of evolution is much like my recovery. It's gone from like a bad place to you know, a place of, of acknowledgement and working on bits of myself to now this different journey or this different phase of my life. Uh, and I know, you you know, there's, there's shame in your story too. Do you think back to that or, or does that relate to you at all? How I, how I mentioned my shame? Oh, absolutely. Not only in my own journey, but in 100% of the people I've worked with. Um, In my model and my book, Conscious Recovery, I actually identify toxic shame as one of the root causes of addiction. And I've seen that being so pervasive in really everyone I've ever worked with coming into recovery or coming out of an addiction. And I think for you know, the LGBTQIA plus community, there's even more in so many ways than some other people might have experienced. Um, I know times are changing, but for many of us, it's almost an automatic thing to have shame growing up in a culture that tells us we should, you know, because of our gender act a certain way, because of you know, who who and what we are as a person is fundamentally wrong or bad in some way. And sometimes religion gets added to that. So not only do I think you're bad, but God also does as well. So there are so many layers to this. And I absolutely know that healing my shame and helping people I work with heal their shame 
is so important in recovery. I think we can't actually move into sustained long-term recovery until we actually heal some of that shame. And I, it's June, so I also want to acknowledge it's my sobriety birthday month, and I just celebrated 38 years, which I'm so grateful for. Congratulations. Who would have ever guessed, right? I guess yes. it is true when they say you just don't drink and use and don't die, and these years add up, and that has absolutely come to pass. <laughs> wow, 38 years. So correct me if I'm wrong, did you get sober in Texas? I did. I got sober in Dallas, yeah. Yeah. What has the evolution yeah. of queer culture been like in your recovery, too? Well, I mean, it's interesting, even that term, right? That was such a bad yes. word. And we, as little kids, we played smear the queer. I was thinking yeah. back on that. Like that was literally the game, right? Like, and that's, again, one of those things that was just so much shame, even though at the time I didn't even question what that meant. Yeah. I just knew there was something bad about that, right? And we were literally, the goal was to like hit them with the ball. I mean, it's just quite intense actually to think back and my earliest memories um is just like don't act like a girl don't walk like a girl don't talk like a girl right so the evolution of pride has been an interesting thing and and i actually at some point in today's conversation i want to talk about what might be the next step even beyond pride because in some ways pride can be a response to the shame and an important one. But I also think it's important that we even move beyond that. So, I mean, that's a very long-winded way of saying, yes, the evolution of pride has been significant. I mean, I remember in 1994 going to the 25-year celebration of in, in New York, right? The the 25-year the um, anniversary, if you will, of the Stonewall Riots, where it's really the modern queer movement began. And that has been some time ago now as well, right? So we continue to evolve and continue to open up to new ways of being and seeing for sure. Wow. Yes. I love hearing, like, I'm kind of a, a history nerd, not in like the you know, World War I, World War II sense, but more of like nostalgic things that, you know, I can relate to, I guess, that have happened in history. So I love hearing about, you know, these, um, I was watching a, a documentary um, about Stonewall and, uh, you know, the this current season of, of Drag Race is like paying homage to, um, you know, those who, who fought for, uh, the the rights and, and privileges that we have today. Um, so let me ask you about this idea of, so shame being, um, you know, this sort of common um, experience, I guess, that we, that we have as, um, you know, queer individuals at an early age. And I remember like this idea of not, not, were always being conscious of how I was presenting myself in public and um, sort of, you know, if I had to walk across a room or go up to the blackboard in, in school and hearing from family members and others, you know, kids are mean, but I heard from adults too, like, don't act like a girl, don't talk like a girl. Um, so I was always uber aware of how I was presenting myself. And I think that shame developed before I even knew what gay was and that I, that I identified with, you know, being gay. Um, how, or I guess why do we associate shame with these different characteristics or aspects of ourself, um, is it simply because the perception of other people? Yeah, I mean, when we're really young, we don't really have the cognitive ability or the maturity to understand. Maybe we're in a society that's a little bit broken in some ways in terms of how they're framing gender and orientation yeah. and race. And we could, you know, go on and on with that. But um, we absorb it, right? Our brains aren't even developed enough. So as a little kid, if we're told, and I, I'll give you an example. So it's it's wild to think about. I was actually alive at Stonewall. I mean, I, granted, I was four years old during Stonewall or... <laughs> actually three, almost four, but I'm still, that's the, the energy I'm from. That's the consciousness that I'm from, right? And I, my grandmother had a gay brother 
born either in the late 1800s or early 1900s. So this is going way back. And I remember he had a partner and we called them both uncle, but my grandmother swore he wasn't gay, right? It was so much denial. No one yeah. ever acknowledged. And yet we had these two uncles. And I remember one time he came over and I, I was a little kid, maybe seven, six, seven. And I went running up to him, put my arms around him and he pushed me off and he pointed at me and said, boys don't hug men like that. And that was his own internalized homophobia just literally being shot into me energetically. And the reason I'm talking about this is it's not really a cognitive process to heal. And in some ways, I and mean, I hope we can have a nuanced conversation, but in some ways, pride can almost be a response to the, the shame. It's like, well, I'll show you, right? Yeah. And in some ways, that's really important as part of the healing. And I hope that we're moving beyond that as well, because that has been true in my own journey. But Shame, it's really important to identify, and of course, everyone really knows this, but like shame is a belief that we are fundamentally broken. It doesn't have anything to do with our behavior. It has to do with what we absorbed and the really core ideas that we carry about ourselves. And honestly, it's really more of a frequency. I remember that feeling of him shooting that into me, and I, I use that consciously because I could almost feel the shame coming in, and I remember just closing. And there were so many experiences of closing as a little kid. And then I made these big decisions. So it's really, again, it's not a cognitive process to heal this because it's something that was absorbed before our brains were even developed. Yeah, that's a great point. Like we can wear the shirts and we can fly the flag, you know, at our house. But, um, you know, have we worked on healing you know, that feeling of being broken, I think is the more important conversation there. That's right. And it's it collectively too, because yes. um, we, we look at uh, our community and sometimes I, I can see some of the things that happen collectively in, in our community are really a trauma response. And it's very understandable. We would never want to say we shouldn't be doing that, but we also want to say, how can we individually and collective, collectively do the deeper healing so that we can actually be stronger. Because as you said, yes, it is about being proud. Yes, it is about the rainbow flag. Yes, it is about being visible and all that's important. And then there's also the deeper healing that for many of us is required. And for those of us who have addiction, uh, if we're going to maintain our, our sobriety, um, it's going to be a requirement for us. But I also think as a community, as a Globally, healing this is going to be really important. And I feel like that's the phase we're moving into now. Hey there, future podcaster. I'm Nate Kelly. And today I'm thrilled to introduce you to something that is going to transform your podcasting journey. Are you ready to turn your passion for podcasting into a thriving reality? Let me introduce you to the Podcast Launch Accelerator. Imagine a six-month mentorship program where you get personalized one-on-one -on -one coaching, an action plan tailored to your goals, and a comprehensive podcast growth blueprint. But wait, there's more. We're throwing in exclusive interviews with industry experts, a professional podcast success toolkit, and access to our monetization masterclass. At the end of six months, we guarantee you a spot in the top 10%, appearance on top iTunes or Spotify charts, and a monetized podcast with host Red Ads. Ready to launch your podcast? Click the link below to secure your spot in the Podcast Launch Accelerator. TJ is an inspirational speaker. He is an author. He is a recovery expert. And I wanted to touch base on conscious creation. And I've sort of become fascinated with the idea that we can kind of create the life that we want to live, right? Yes. Yeah. Because the, the whole premise of conscious creation is we're always creating, we're creating unconsciously or consciously. And the quote that I opened the book with is from Carl Jung, and he says, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we will call it fate. So we want to look at how we can bring all everything that's in the unconscious into conscious awareness so that we can start to heal it. And working with people over the years, and certainly in my own journey, I thought it was like set a goal, set an intention, make it happen. 
but there's something much deeper. And so in the process that I've created, the first two steps in this process are really about clearing the past traumas, clearing the core false beliefs we're carrying, and quite frankly, healing that shame so that we can enter into a place of looking deeply within ourselves to create the life of our dreams. But, you know, if you have an old painting and you're trying to just put new paint over it, it's going to continue to seep through. So we really need to do healing first before we start to create. So five steps to embracing the life of your dreams. And I know that you use the acronym of movie, right? Um, can we walk yes. through, through the steps of, of creating that life? Yeah. And so the, 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 the five steps, the reason I use the acronym movie, it worked out well because the five steps, I had to tweak it a little, but I made it into movie. You made it work. But it's the, I, <laughs> I made it work. Yeah. Well, I can tell you it was foovy in the beginning, but we'll talk about that in a moment. That just doesn't work very well. But the idea is that you're, you're holding the camera and you are actually projecting onto a blank canvas. In other words, um, Byron Katie says, if we have, it's like we're carrying a camera and we have a piece of lint on the lens and we see that lint everywhere and we think it's happening in the world. We go about trying to change the world, but really it's about clearing that lens. So that's the basic idea of why it's movie. We want to start creating a new movie for our life. Genius. So the five steps, I, I can just go through them and then, you know, I'm sure we'll dive into them. But yeah, M yeah. is make, yeah. making peace with the past. O, overcoming core false beliefs. V, visioning. I intention setting and E embodying the vision. And it used to be forgiveness. That's why I said FUVI just didn't really work as a great ac acronym. <laughs> now it's making peace. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so making peace with the past. And I guess if we relate it to recovery, is this kind of uh, like a fourth step, fifth step, or more like ninth, or do you look at it in, in conjunction or in tandem with your recovery or those you work with, or is this kind of two separate uh, ideas for you? Well, I think, you know, the 12 steps were derived from ancient spiritual teachings, right? So um, anytime we're looking at spiritual principles like forgiveness, the 12 steps have adapted that as so many of us have, because there are these profound truths that have been around for centuries, right? Um, the right. reason that I call call it making peace with the past, other than, of course, the acronym, is forgiveness is such a loaded word. Forgiveness is one of those words that is so deeply entrenched in good and bad and right and wrong. This person did something that's unforgivable, and I have to find a way to forgive them. So if we shift that to making peace, we move out of like, was it right or wrong that they did it? And then, and then into the question, can I make peace with it? And I can't help but think of our community and the trauma that we've experienced when we say something to someone like, oh, the, 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 the LGBTQIA plus community should just forgive what happened. That's a yeah. really tall order because there's some stuff that happened that have been really, has been really significant. But if we say, regardless of what has happened, regardless of what my grandfather did, my grandmother did, the kids on the playground, a person in my church, regardless of what they did, can I find a way to make peace with that? Because that is taking our power back. I've worked with people who have, you know, severe trauma, like a sexual trauma, sexual trauma, and the person isn't even alive, but they still have that person on the hook because they can't get into forgiveness. And so simply saying, rather than looking at what happened, can you make peace with that? Because really the past is less about what happened and more about what we decided and what we absorbed. That's the point of power. I have the ability to make peace regardless of what has happened. And then, you know, we start to move out of being in victim consciousness. And I know this is a layered conversation. So if someone's watching right now, if you felt any reaction, I invite you to take a look at that because I'm not saying what happened was okay. That debate is where I think we get stuck. We're going to shift the conversation and say, regardless of what happened, right, wrong, good, bad, we're going to look at what I decided and what I absorbed because that I have the power to start to heal. And so it's a really important first step in healing shame and in conscious creation. We're going to take, we're going to not let the person off the hook, but we're going to shift our focus from what they did to what we decided and what we absorbed. And then we start to become empowered to do our own healing. Mm. 
That's that's powerful. And not to lessen the severity of what anyone may or may not have done to you, but not wasting energy on things that we can't control. That's right. And and I think um, it is nuanced because there is, for many of us, there's a place at which part of the healing does seem that we're blaming the other person. And I think it's part of the journey. I remember when I got into recovery, I said, I have the best parents ever. I had no no difficulties in my childhood. Yeah. I was one of those, right? But then like six, month, six months yeah. in, I was like, I had the very worst parents ever. They were horrible. <laughs> I mean, it was like all about blaming them. And then I, as I progressed in my journey spiritually through therapy, um, I realized that I, I did come to a place of regardless of what they have done, a place of compassion, but it really isn't about them. It was really about, again, I'm going to repeat it, but what I decided and what I absorbed because that is, I can become empowered to do that healing. If I think it's going to be okay if that person apologizes, I might be waiting for that for decades. So true. So number two, overcoming core false beliefs. So in your experience and in your conversations, are there a group of, I guess, common misconceptions or common core beliefs that we seem to think we are lacking in or groups that we can be put into? Absolutely. There are there are some top, the top 10, if you will, I could probably yeah. name 10, but I'll say the few that I hear most often. And I want to, before I say that, I want to say the reason that I add the word false, because a lot of times we talk about core beliefs. I want to add the word false because these are lies that we've picked up about ourselves, And these yes. lies were absorbed yes. at a very young age. I decided I was stupid at age five. That was not a conscious thought. I didn't even have the cognitive ability to understand. I had absorbed that. So Having said that, some of the core false beliefs that I hear most often is I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy, and I'm not good enough. Those seem to be the three most popular, but there are nuanced versions of those and some other ones. Like I said, I'm stupid, and I know that's a really harsh word, but that's that was the inner dialogue that I had. Mm. And that just – those just perpetuate – these these other insecurities or these other shortcomings, you know, perhaps that we think we have uh, into sort of this vicious spiral, at least in my experience, this is this is very relatable. Yeah, and I love that you use the word vicious, and I'll tell you why. Um, the framework that I use is we have core false beliefs. And then we have brilliant strategies or what I call BS, right? BS, brilliant <laughs> yeah. strategies. And those yeah. strategies are trying to manage the core false belief. And when they originate, they did help us, but quite often they become um, outdated. For example, I felt I, I was unworthy. And so the way I showed up in the world is I've, I'm so good. I've got this together. I'm perfect. I, I'm, you know, so it was like, I wanted to look good. I wanted to sound perfect. Every word had to be perfect. I had to look perfect. So this sort of perfectionism became the strategy and that did help me, but ultimately it wasn't healing the core false belief because the way we heal it, because we're talking about shame, this core false belief is synonymous with shame because it's an energy too. It wasn't just I felt unworthy. It was that I was vibrating with that frequency. And no matter how much work I did, I kept replicating that because we end up attracting and we're attracted to unconsciously situations to confirm that. The deeper healing is taking a look at the core false beliefs. And again, we could look at the, the queer community and some of the core false beliefs we collectively have, understandably, and then what's our brilliant strategy and sometimes it's in your face and fighting and that has a role and then there's the deeper healing oh my gosh let's do some collective healing on what happened when we were so young and we absorbed that the more we heal that the less we need to be in the strategy and the more we can be in the curiosity so for visioning is that envisioning or sort of picturing this life that we want I am so happy you asked it that way because uh, visioning is actually very different than visualization. Okay, good. Visualization is kind of what you're talking about, right? We've All of us at this point, well, most of us have done the vision boards. We've done the yeah. law of attraction. We've done all of that. What do I want? And let me just hold that thought and manifest it. 
not at all what we're talking about here. I want to always acknowledge my friend Michael Beckwith, who created the life visioning process. And in Conscious Creation, I acknowledge him and use his framework for this step. So I always want to give credit where credit is due. Visioning is not holding a thought or an idea in our mind and trying to manifest it. Visioning is, to the best of our ability, emptying the mind. And we could talk more about that because it's not necessarily about emptying the mind. It's like, thank you for sharing, coming. Because once we've done the making peace with the past and the overcoming core false beliefs, it allows us to be more in touch with an internal guidance system or inner wisdom. Visioning is to the best of our ability, letting go of or living beyond preconceived ideas about what we want, what we want spending time in the silence, using Michael's visioning process, asking questions and listening to the inner, to inner wisdom. And then from there, allowing that to become the way that we are guided, totally different way of being. And to me, it's one. Actually like polar opposites. Exactly. From <laughs> exactly. Polar opposites. Indeed. Yes. And then we have the uh, intention setting and embodying your envision, which sounds like, um, or your vision, which sounds like a little bit more uh, of what I was talking about. And perhaps, you know, this idea of setting the, setting the expectation, setting your intention moving forward. Absolutely. So once we've done the work, which is an ongoing process of making peace with the past, overcoming core false beliefs or healing shame, we spend time in the silence. We ask inner wisdom what wants to be revealed. We get these messages. We've done enough time of sitting with those messages. The I and the E are really the action portions of that. Not that there weren't actions in the first three, but this is where we start to get concrete. My friend Gregory Spencer has this really great model, and I adapt it and use it in conscious creation. And it's just very tangible, very specific. Let me create intention six months from now specific, measurable, realistic, but a stretch. There's a whole process I explain in the book and the workbook, but this has changed my life because some people want to jump right into the action. And I've been that person, but I've also been the person that just like, oh, let me just sit in the inactivity, right? So this mm. is where we do the action. Um, there's an accountability piece to it. I still, every single week, I still email my action items and what I did for the week. So this is where we start to get specific and measurable. And honestly, it's changed my life in such profound ways. The specificity of, of things yeah. when you're setting an intention or setting goals, being specific and uh, achievable, but stretch. I like the way that you put that, like you need to stretch yourself, but uh, still within the, the realm of achievability, I think is important. And that, that specificity is, is so important. Yeah. When I first started doing this process over 15 years ago, I would, I sent my original intentions. And for example, when it came to the money piece, I said that I want to make X number of dollars a month. Yeah. And my friend, my friend Gregory responded with, okay, what do you want your life to look like? And I said, these are the things I want. He said, I've got news for you. You live in San Francisco, which I did at the time. You're not going to be able to live that life with that number that you gave. So you're going to have to stretch that. Um, and I was like, oh, so it would, that was realistic and achievable. And then I was like, let me stretch that. Stretch and in it, that yeah. stretch, created that vacuum, if you will. And that really allowed me to step into a much bigger version of my life. And again, if we're going back to visioning, when we receive these messages from our inner wisdom, we know that we have everything within us to fulfill them. So that stretch is an important, important piece. You know, maybe we don't want to say, oh, I'm going to go way over here. We want to do it incrementally, but we do want to make sure that it's realistic and a stretch. So thank you for pointing that out. Sure. And so al along the last two steps, our action, we kind of touched on and then embodying your vision. How do we sort of live this? It's, it's kind of like dressing for the job that you want, right? Or like living the life before it's in place. 
That's right. It's that, and it's also because we've done a lot of the work of healing the shame and the core false beliefs, if we if we see those creeping up, we say, thank you for sharing. I remember who I am. I'm an infinite being. I am capable of this. I received this message and vision. Therefore, I know that I have everything within me to do it. It's really more about frequency because it is about acting as if, but it's not about pretending. And I think that's really important because if I'm pretending like, I've got, I, I'm the person that I want to be. That's kind of that older model with law of attraction, if you will. But if I don't believe it, it's like, yeah, but really, I don't think I deserve it. We go back and do that deeper healing. Embodying is like really holding that energy and knowing. And then it does become infectious, if you will. And that's kind of a strange word, but yes. like it yeah. attracts it. But it's also, I'm attracted to it. I can't move into a life I don't believe I deserve. So as I feel more and more worthy of, I naturally start to make different choices. Beautiful. So can you share with us some of the benefits or changes in your life since sort of embodying this as your own vision in life? Oh my goodness, I could speak for an hour on this, but I'll just <laughs> share a couple of examples. Yeah. When I started this process and, you know, it wasn't really quite formulated yet, but I was putting the pieces together in my own journey. I remember, and I'm guessing to 2015, maybe 2013, I said, oh, I want to write a book. And so like, that was just an idea. And that was around the time that I started this process. And I had been doing so much intense work on making peace with the past and overcoming core false beliefs. I was introduced to visioning as a very different way of manifesting, if you will, or conscious creation. I had spent a lot of time in the silence asking inner wisdom. The, I, the divine idea of the book came up. I knew what I wanted it to be. I had an idea of what I wanted it to be. And that's when I started doing the intention setting. And I remember getting quiet and asking myself, when does this book want to be published? And it was June of 2015. It just came up, June of 2015. That was 18 months or two years in the future. And I just wrote that down and put that as an intention. And then every week I was doing the action items toward that, that intention or toward that goal. And I believe, I had to go look on Amazon for the published date, but I believe it was May of 2015. It was literally a month before that intention. It all came to be. An important part of this, though, is um, I think sometimes, and I'll put it in the I, I was kind of using the law of attraction as, if I can just manifest all this, then I'll be happy. And that's not what we're talking about in conscious creation. We're saying, I'm already whole and complete. I already have this divine idea of what I want to bring to the world. I'm not trying to manifest, like, I'm not going to be happy when I publish a book. I want to be happy before I publish the book. And through that happiness, an extension of that is I want to bring this message to the world, be in that energy. What am I here to offer, not what am I here to get? So that's just one example. I could name hundreds of examples, but that's a great one. I love that. TJ, we've talked about this before, but a lot of our listeners are still in early recovery or maybe even struggling with addiction. And I like to leave them with sort of some, some tangible things to take away or to maybe start on today. And I know we've talked about a lot of things that, you know, they can uh, physically do or learn or process. I know conscious creation comes with the workbook. That would be genius. But are there any things that you would like to kind of leave our listeners with something that would help them maybe put one step, one foot in front of the other today? Yeah, I'm going to actually tell a little bit of my own story. It'll be very brief, but I think it informs what I'm about to say. Yeah. When I was 18 months sober, I was suicidal. And the reason I share that is I want people to understand that if you're in early recovery and you're struggling in any, in any way, you're not alone. We've been through this. I went through that struggle. And the paradigm at the time sounded something like, don't worry about anything but not drinking, go help someone else, your life is a miracle. And I thought, well, I understand that's true, but I also want to die and I didn't have a place to take it. The reason I'm sharing that part of my own journey is the message I have for anyone watching who is in early recovery or who is struggling to get sober 
if that's an intention of yours, is that I felt so deeply broken and so unworthy of a life filled with love and connection that that was actually getting in the way of me healing what needed to be healed. And I met a woman who took me on a journey of self-discovery. And the fundamental thing I want to share with anyone watching right now is no matter what has happened in your life and no matter what you've done, you are a person worthy of love and connection. And underneath all of your addictive behavior, all of the things that have happened in your life, there's still an essential self that's whole and perfect. And I want to acknowledge that and celebrate that and just say you do deserve a life filled with love and connection. TJ, thank you so much for, uh, I love how you relate your own story to um, sort of tangible things to offer people. I know that uh, what we talked about today, a lot of it comes from conscious creation, but your first book, Conscious Recovery, also available at tjwoodward.com as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. That is true. <laughs> okay, perfect. I will link everything in today's show notes, the books, your website. TJ, thank you for always answering when I call, so to speak, and for always supporting the show and always showing up when you say you're going to. I'm so grateful that we've crossed paths and uh, hopefully, you know, when that next book comes out, we'll be right here again. Thank you so much, Nate. I'm so honored to have been here with you. I'm, I love what you're up to and I'm just grateful for our connection and for this conversation. It's been really fun. Thanks so much for listening today, friends. Hopefully you heard something inspiring and that resonates with you. If you're an aspiring podcaster or have your own message to share, head over to podcastnate.com and book a discovery call. I have helped countless aspiring podcasters to launch their show and share their message, and I'd be honored to help you do the same. Remember, everyone has a story. Yours could help save a life. Make sure you subscribe to The Sobriety Diaries so you never miss an upload. We're back with new episodes every Wednesday. Bye, everyone.